Lord's house tonight. Amen. It's a Wednesday night Bible study at Ambassador Baptist Church. We'd invite you to take your, your uh, Bibles and turn with us tonight uh, to Hebrews chapter 17. Hebrews chapter 17, if you're watching uh, tonight uh, there on the internet, YouTube, we'd encourage you to take your Bible and join with us also uh, so that you're keeping up with it as you in... I'm sorry, I was corrected from the audience back there. My lovely wife is telling me it's Hebrews chapter 11. What did I say? 17? Oh, my mistake. First one I ever made in my entire life, and y'all got involved in it. Amen. Uh, but uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. And uh, we're going to be continuing our study tonight to, uh, talking about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And in our study, we have come to this part uh, of the lesson where it says, By faith, Verse 17, chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according, uh, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the Bible study. Father God, as we come into your presence tonight, we want to tell you that we love you. Father, we never want that to be a trite thing, but uh, just an expression of our heart as your child unto our Heavenly Father. And so with that said, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, meet with us tonight. We know that uh, here in the congregation we've got uh, the staff and and uh, it's going out over the uh, the. Uh, computer and uh, the YouTube type uh, uh, broadcast and we pray that you would be with those that are listening in tonight that it might be an encouragement and a strength and, and Father God that which would really draw us closer uh, to you in this present time for we ask it in Jesus name amen. Uh, tonight as we continue our study we're calling the tonight's lesson a trusting faith. In order to uh, just uh, to trust God by faith according as he has uh, so given us promises uh, through his word. It says by faith Abraham when he was tried. I, I found that the amazing part about God's faith or our faith in God is it always comes a lot of times with trials. When God tests our faith. He tells us, number one, that it is a time that we can strengthen our faith in God and that it is a time by which we can expand or grow our faith also in God. And so uh, with that understanding, it said when Abraham was tried, when he was put to the test, so to speak. It's easy to say, I love God and I trust God. It's something else to really express it by the way that you live under a trial or a difficulty. And sort of like the, uh, this is no new thing, but sort of like the, uh, the guy that uh, told everybody he could walk across or push a wheelbarrow across the Grand Canyon bearing 250 pounds of uh, weight in the wheelbarrow. And everybody applauded and said, yeah, we believe you can do it. We think you can do it. And they all showed up to see it. And so he got uh, there and got everything arranged and he got in the wheelbarrow, uh, the 250 pounds and, uh, of rocks or whatever it was, and he pushed it across the Grand Canyon, turned around and pushed it back. And when he got back to where the crowd was, they was applauding and, and going on about he had done this great thing he said he would do. And he just simply asked him a question. He said, how many of you believe I can do it again? And everybody raised their hand and plotted, yeah, we believe you can do it again. So he dumped the, the rocks or the weight out of the wheelbarrow and said, who'll get in the wheelbarrow so that I can show you I can do it again? He had no takers. That's the difference between trust and belief. You can believe something, but when you're put to the test, it de determines on whether or not you really trust in what you believe 
whether or not you're going to stand to the test. Now here Abraham, as he was uh, given, uh, given the promises. Now uh, one of the things that I found about the promises of God is, is simply this. A lot of times God promises something that we don't necessarily see come to pass immediately. Sometimes you just have to got to wait, wait on God to bring his time uh, into uh, full view in order for that promise to happen. Now Abraham was given a number of promises, and I'm going to hit just six of them tonight uh, very quickly. Uh, and to give you an understanding of where Abraham was coming from when God was talking to him about the uh, offering up his son. Number one, God promised Abraham a land, or the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, according to Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Now, Abraham's just like you and I. Abraham knew that he was not going to live forever. Amen. I forget there's nobody out there but staff. So if you hear, if you hear a distant, amen, it's one of the staff back there that's agreeing with their preacher. Amen. Uh, and so, but uh, we all know that we're not going to live forever. And so when God told Abraham, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, Abraham knew that it was not going to be him that was going to be living there. But yet it was a promise that God made him that was going to carry on throughout generations of generations of generations. And can I tell you, those people that are fighting over the promised land right now are wrong. Everybody call in and call Brother Mark Smith on that one. Amen. Uh, but they're wrong according to what God just promised Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan uh, from the, uh, the, the river of Egypt until the great river of the Euphrates. All the land, and he names all the different tribes that were there at that time. He said, I'm going to give you this land as an everlasting possession. Abraham never seen that come to, come to, to full view. But yet he trusted God that it was going to happen. Another promise that God gave uh, Abraham was that he would have a son by Sarah, according to Genesis 17, 15, and 16. Now he told, now God told Abraham, you go back and read it, God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, or you and Sarah will bear a son, and he will be the heir. Now, if you study that out, you're going to find out that Sarah didn't know that yet. And because she didn't understand or didn't know what God had promised Abraham, she, all she seen was the natural effects of it, that she had no children, Abraham had no heir, and she wanted to fix it. Amen for women that like to fix things. Amen. Because if they weren't trying to fix things, most of us would never get married. I think every, every woman, not every woman, but most women, when they meet their husband, they, they fall in love and they're the love of their life. And all of a sudden, when you say, I do, there's a whole list of things that they go about to fix in you. My wife has done a great job fixing me. Amen. Because if she hadn't have fixed me, I'd still be a bum. Amen. And, uh, you know, God had a lot of help in that, uh, but women like to fix things. And so uh, Sarah decided that she was going to fix the problem that Abraham had without having an heir. And so she gave Abraham her handmaid to have a child with so that she could raise up a child through her handmaid to be Abraham's heir. Now, in the world of logic... That was good logic at the time that she decided it. But in the eyes of faith, it was all wrong. In fact, after it happened, Sarah realized that she had made a mistake and she went back and told her husband, she said, may God judge between you and I whether it was my mistake to offer or was it your mistake to take. Abraham knew what the promise was. 
Abraham knew that God said that, that he's going to give you an heir. He's going to give you a son through Sarah. And somewhere down the lines, Abraham's trust began to wane. He was old. He had no heirs. And all of a sudden, a logical fulfillment of that promise came to fact. And so with that said, he stepped out side of what God had told him and went into the natural things and his trust was tested. God later come to, to Abraham and he said, now I told you he was going to have a son with, with, with Sarah and Sarah's standing in the tent door at this time and he said, at this time next year you're going to have that son. And Sarah laughed. Because she was well stricken in age and past the time of childbearing. Her husband was 14 years now past, or 13 years now past the age of childbearing. And it just didn't make any logical sense that God would prepare or, or fulfill that promise that he was giving them. And so inside her little heart, she giggled a little. <laughs> just to herself. And God simply said, Sarah, why did you laugh? And Sarah said, oh, I didn't laugh. And God said, yeah, you did. Now listen to me. A lot of times we do a lot of things in our heart that we don't think anybody understands or knows about it, but God does. And God will reprimand us in those places. So he promised, he promised Abraham a son by Sarah. And then he also promised Abraham that the son he had through the bondwoman, Ishmael, would be blessed of God and become a great nation. And Ishmael did. He had 12 sons, just like Isaac did. And out of those 12 sons came 12 kingdoms, and they have been uh, the, heirs, uh, uh, the heirs of the promise that God had made to Abraham concerning Ishmael all these years. So God promised, uh, promised him uh, the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, he promised a son through Sarah. He promised that he would bless Ishmael. He promised that uh, uh, God would uh, uh, establish the covenant with Isaac as his heir. And exactly when Isaac would be born, according to Genesis 17, 21. Now, I don't know about you, but I like that promise. I like it when God says, I'm going to do something, and this is the time it's going to happen. And you can stand and just see the hand of God begin to work. I like that. I, sometimes uh, I, I, I don't like it so much when I happen to wait. Amen. Uh, I think that's what Mary and Martha did. They was waiting on Jesus to show up so that Lazarus wouldn't die. And when Lazarus died, uh, the, the natural reaction was, uh, you know, Lord, if it, you'd have been here, he had not have died. But if they would have exercised a trusting faith in what God said, they wouldn't have never, never made that statement. So the problem, the problem a lot of times is we like it when God gives us a promise and tells us exactly when it's going to be fulfilled. Then we can sit back and rest upon the promise of God. But oftentimes we're not given when it's going to be fulfilled. So Abraham here was uh, given when he was tried, though he had some promises, uh, just began to trust God in those promises. Uh, God promised to him that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him, according to Genesis 18, 18. And we know that Abraham never seen the promise fulfilled while he walked, in, walked the earth. In fact, it was some almost 2,000 years later when that all happened through Jesus Christ our Lord. And through Jesus, the offspring of Abraham, I, I came all the nations of the world's blessing. Every individual now, because of Abraham's faith, has a means by which they can be saved. And so that's a blessing that was given to Abraham. Another Abraham, another blessing that was given to Abraham, uh, and told him this. He, he said, Abraham, you're going to die well stricken in age. Otherwise, you're going to die at a very old age. Now, in the day and time in which we live with the coronavirus, 
we're not real sure whether we've got a week or two weeks to live. You get somebody that's old and bad health like me, overweight, diabetic, heart condition, and, you know, you just write on my forehead, he's a goner. You know, I go, <coughs> and everybody starts spreading out and calling the undertaker. I'm of that, that period that I am at, at extreme risk. But you know what I do know? I got enough trusting faith in my God that if he chooses the coronavirus to take me out of this world, hallelujah. If he, if he decides to take me out of this world with a heart attack, hallelujah. If he decides to take me out of the, this world in a diabetic coma because I ate two and a half dozen donuts, my bad. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, that's why God gave us ten fingers. So we could have ten donuts all at one time. And just fulfill the lust of the flesh and all that sugar. So God gave me diabetes so I wouldn't do it. But you know what? I, I honestly believe that God says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this is the judgment. And so I've got an allotted time upon this earth, whether it's a coronavirus, an accident, or a diabetic coma, heart attack, whatever. God says, you got a time, you better use it wisely. And I'm trusting God with the, with, in my faith till you do that. So he gave him one more promise that I'm going to talk about tonight, and then we'll move on. He told Abraham, he said, now this is a promise. He said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. And I'm going to curse them that curse you. And a lot of people says, well, you know, that was just in Abraham's day. Oh, yeah? Look around. See what's happening to the enemies of the people that have cursed Abraham's children. And I know there's a lot of people who don't want to hear that. But can I tell you, they're still God's chosen nation. Still God's chosen people. And I believe as a nation... <laughs> I'm going to get political here. I believe as a nation, we ought to just trust God and trust what he said and bless Israel. Now saying all that, he said, Abraham, when he was tried, when he was put to the test, even though he had some promises that God had given him, he offered up his only begotten son. Now, I, I, just for a second, I want you to get a hold of this. And that is that God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation, innumerable as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea at, for number. But I'm not using Ishmael. I'm going to use Isaac. And so now God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, go take Isaac. Now I'm going to put you to the test in your faith, Abraham. I'm going to really test whether you not you believe me or whether you really trust me. So take your son, your only begotten son. And when God was saying that, he said, you take your son, the one that is the heir of, of your all in your inheritance, the one I'm going to bring about the, the possession of the land, the one that I'm going to carry on the covenant with, you take him and go offer him on a mountain. And I'll show you where it's at. And you go offer him as a sac burnt sacrifice unto me. Now, I don't know about you, but the logic of the, uh, the, the human mind says, Okay, how's that going to happen? You told me you're going to use him. Now you're going to tell me to kill him. And there's a conflict a lot of times between trust and logic. Now somebody said that there is a fine line between faith and stupidity. But can I tell you something? <laughs> there, there is a multitude of stumbling blocks between faith and and trust. And a lot of people want to believe. They just don't want to trust God with the outcome. Abraham, on the other hand, trusted God to the point that he took two of his, two of his young men and got the wood and the fire and Isaac. And they took off on a journey and God showed him the mountain. And uh, he left the young men there with the animals and, and you go back and study this. This is a, a, just a tremendous verse. 
uh, he told the young men, he said, you tarry here. Me and the lad will go a little bit further and worship and we will come again. He didn't say, I will. He said, we will. We will come again. And so he left him there. He went up to the mountain. And Isaac looked at his daddy and he said, Daddy. Now I'm paraphrasing. He said, Daddy, we got the wood. We got the fire. But Daddy, where, where, where's the sacrifice? Now, you know, I, every once in a while my mind just runs, runs amok. And I can put myself in the shoes of young Isaac. And, you know, logic is going, uh-oh. I think I'm in trouble. Uh, we got fire. We got wood. And Daddy's got a rope. But I don't see a burnt burn sacrifice anywhere. So they built their altar. Got all ready for the sacrifice. And Abraham reached over. Got a hold of the knife. And the angel out of heaven said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thy hand to the lad. You've proved you trust me. You was willing to give that which you loved and which was given to you as a promise and through which all the promises that I have given you through your covenant is going to be fulfilled. You trusted me enough to offer him according to my word. And so Abraham, lay not thy hand to the lad. Little boy <laughs> said, Daddy, where's the, where's the sacrifice? Abraham would have made, uh, again, one of the most prophetic statements that's ever been written in the Word of God if you just read it right. Abraham told Isaac, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And he did through Jesus Christ. God offered himself a sacrifice. And with that, with that said, so uh, Abraham there trusted God enough to believe his promises. Uh, in fact, he trusted God so much. Now listen to me. He trusted God so much that when he left the, his uh, young men with the, the animals at the bottom of the mountain, he trusted God enough that he told them, we will come again. He trusted God enough that said, though I will slay him, you can raise him up. Out of the ashes. Because he's the fulfillment of the promise. You know sometimes. The day and time in which we need live. We need to have that kind of trust. In the promises of God. God said I'll never leave you. Nor forsake you. And too many times. God's people run into. An, a, a, a trial. And by the way. God tempts no man. With temptation. He puts a trial in your, in your path and then he tests you with that trial for a particular reason that, that God would have that trial to come into your life. And it becomes a temptation when we are drawn away by our own lust. Otherwise, we take a situation that God has put us in to try us and we take it and use it to our own selfish desires, whether it be the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the, uh, the uh, pride of life. We just take the situation and we try to make it to the best that we have rather than to trust God with it. God said, I'd never leave you nor forsake you. And too many of us are trusting in the government more than we're trusting in God. We're trusted in our medical establishment. Great. Thank God for a medical establishment. Thank God for those first line responders in the medical field that are willing to put their life on the line to help the others that are sick with this virus that's going on. And by the way, God knows the virus is here. God knows how long it's going to last. You know, God didn't wake up one morning and says, oh, Somebody's sick with a new virus. God has allowed that to happen. Y'all stay with me. I believe with all my heart. God has allowed this to come into our great nation to try his people. Are we going to trust him? Now listen to me. 
I'm not saying be stupid. Oops. My wife tells me not to use that word. Uh, in fact, we're not supposed to use stupid or shut up in, uh, in, our, in our home. And I found that out the wrong way when I used them both in one sentence when we was talking together. It took me a week to be able to say anything else after my lips. You know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, you know, so, so, many, so many times we, we want to trust in the establishment around us rather than trusting God. God knows this virus is here. I believe that God has brought this virus into our great nation to try His children. We can't come sit down in a church service. How many of you are going to come back to church when this is over? Amen. I mean, now, now we're, we're, we're seeing uh, the, the congregation sitting at home, uh, is oftentimes dressed in their, their, their home apparel, <laughs> some not dressed at all. That's okay. They're in the privacy of their own home. And they're, they're coming to and watching a, a, a lesson or a message like this on, on YouTube or the, the Internet, and, and uh, you get, get kind of comfortable that way. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say, why don't we worship like that all the time? How many of us are going to trust God enough to come back to his house when this is over? How many of us are going to trust God? Y'all stay with me. How many of us are going to trust God with our finances after this? You see, we, we are encouraging our people, we're encouraging all of God's children to stay faithful in their giving to their local church. And God said, you bring the tithes and the offerings into the house of God. And, and so as the children of God, as a member of a church, we ought to be faithful in keeping the church doors open so that when this is over, we can pick up right where we left off. Do you trust God? But you don't understand, preacher. I don't have an income. I, I, my, our, our finances are in the, to uh, in the, in the tank, and, and, and we have nothing. Well, go to your neighbor. He's got 100 rolls of toilet paper. No, I'm kidding. But isn't it, isn't it sad <laughs> that we can't trust God when we have nothing? Oh, by the way, so many of us don't trust God when we've got something. So how many of us are going to trust God just for the future? Just to allow God to work out in us His will according to our faith. <laughs> I'm going to tell you real quick. If you got a, a stimulus check, It's not going to go very far. So who are you going to lean on when it's gone? Uncle Sam can only print so much money. And the more money they print, of less value it's going to be. Abraham, by faith, when he was test tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able. I love that. God was able. In the most trying, difficult situation, God is still able. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. His power has not diminished. His love for His people and, the, and, and this world has not lessened. God's still able. Accounting that God was able to rise Him up, even from the dead, from whence also He received Him in a figure. Can I tell you something? One of the reasons I don't worry so much about the coronavirus is because if I die, I know God can God's going to raise me up. I wonder tonight, do you have that promise? Do you have that promise? Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Because if you don't, you don't have that promise. 
if you know Christ as your Savior, there's been a time in your life when you bowed your head and told God that you knew you was a sinner and couldn't save yourself. And that you believed that he died to pay your sin debt. And in that faith, you wanted him to come into your heart and to save you and be the Lord of your life from that point on. If you've never done that, you don't have the promise of heaven. Now, if you have done that, then can I tell you, trust God. Because one day, he'll resurrect you also. Now, Joe's going to come and shut the, shut the, the broadcast off for tonight. But can I tell you something? We need to have enough faith. Come on, Joe. Have enough faith. Not just to believe God, but to trust him. In everything, with everything. We're going to have a word of prayer as we're going off the air uh, tonight. And let me, let me just say this. We need to be praying for our president and those that are in charge of making laws. We need to be praying for our first responders and those in the medical field that's on the line. We need to be praying for one another in this most difficult time. Let's trust God together. Father, as we come in your presence.